Yes. <laughs> okay, so those are the basic laboratory interferences. So, <laughs> so limitations of detectors, relationship between the detector response and the analyte concentration. So we can look at absorption spectrometers, right? What's the, the relationship between, with an absorption spectrom spectrometer, what's the, the relationship between the, the, the detector voltage and the, and the concentration? Yeah, it's logarithmic, right? Because it measures the percent, what? Transmittance. So if your transmittance is really, really high or really, really low, it <laughs> You read the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> Give her a chance. She also feels smart, too. <laughs> She's doing good. If it's really high or really low, then your the logarithmic scale makes it angry. Yes, angry and stuff. <laughs> Fluorescence uses a, it's linearly related between the the amount of light being shined and and, and the voltage because the detector detects the light and that amount of light is proportional to the voltage it sends the signal on. Refractive index and electrochemical are also linearly related. And then the, specifically the absorption spectrophotometer, logarithmic relationship between percent transmittance and absorbance, because what the machine reads is the percent transmittance. So at low percent transmittance, small changes will result in large changes in absorbance, right? And those machines are going to have variability just built in, noise in the machine. So any variability in that, if you have low percent transmittance, it's absorbing a lot, right? So you've got a really high absorbance, so low percent transmittance. If you look at that logarithmic scale, say we go to 10 to 9 here, or I give you an example here. If you go from 5% from, uh, to 15% transmittance, you go from an absorbance, change in absorbance is 0.65. That's almost one whole absorbance unit. So that's a huge change in what your measured concentration would be, right? And that could just be... 10% noise versus 60% to 50% you get a change in absorbance is 0.08 so it's a much more negligible change. This is a huge change and a much more negligible change. So errors in your absorbance spec, the percent transmitting results in an electrical signal from the detector, that's what I was talking about before. When absorbance is zero, percent transmittance is going to be 100 which results in the maximum electric signal and you presume that the variation in that electrical signal that the, 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 the machine is reading, there's going to be a constant variation you know, throughout the scale from 0 to 100%. You assume that that's constant, which means that a 1% variation at 10 100% transmittance results in plus or minus 1% transmittance versus the same variation at 50% is going to be equal 2% absolute error, right? Because 1% of, you know, the percentage 1% of 50% is 2%. <laughs> Does that make sense? 1 over 50 is 2%. So it basically doubles the error. And then at 10% 10 10 transmittance, that makes it a 10% error. So that noise in the machine is going to be constant. So at the lower percent transmittance, you get more error. So when you combine the two increases in error together, you get a graph like your book shows, the relative absor absorbance error, and you have really high absorbance error at high absorbances and really high absorbance error at low absorbances, right? So that makes it that you want to measure your analyte somewhere in between. And they pick, you want, you want absorbance to be between 0.1 and 1.1 when you're using a spectrophotometer, because that's when you're going to have the lowest amount of absorbance error. Do you see how those two are put together? At, <clears throat> at high absorbances or low percent transmittance, you get all that error from the, the voltage of the machine. At low absorbances with high percent transmittances, it's the it's coming from the logarithmic scale, right? Or did I just say that backwards? 
So fluorescent specs, fluorescent signals, linearly related to concentration. So two times the signal should indicate two times the concentration. That's the way it's supposed to work. And that's if the sample doesn't absorb. Sometimes those samples can absorb the same light that they're emitting on. So if you have light, the fluorescent light being generated by the sample and then it absorb, is absorbed by the sample, it's a bad thing because that's going to throw off your, 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 your signal. So you should, the sample should be diluted so that the absorbance is less than 0.1 because you want to be able to get all the light through and read all the fluorescence coming off. Light scatter also, or stray light, can have large effects on the signal. You have stray light coming in that's going to make an apparent increase in signal. Same thing with light scatter. What's going to cause light scatter? That's common in samples? Turbidity, which comes from what? Lipids. Lipids, yeah. VLDLs and, and chylomicrons. High signals can result in inaccuracy too. And if you blank with a high signal, it's going to reduce the sensitivity. So if you have a really high signal and your blank has a really high signal too, the difference between the two isn't going to be that great, so it's going to reduce the sensitivity of those signals. In vitro interferences, analysis are performed in complex matrices, right? That's the substance like plasma, urine, or so forth. You have hundreds of compounds that can mimic the physical, chromatographic, immunological, and spectral properties of the analyte. Disease process can vary composition also. So they're classified as spectral interferences, such as hemolysis. Heme's going to absorb light. Icteria is the bilirubin. It's going to absorb light also, or lipe lipemia, it's going to scatter the light. Or you can have competing chemical reactions. An example of that is caffeine and theophylline will compete with each other for their antibody binding sites. Absorption spectral interferences, so interference causes similar response to the analyte. This is an example of different amounts of heme in the samples, and you can see it gets redder and redder as the concentration increases. Hemoglobin will interfere with the burette reaction. So that measures protein concentration. So hemoglobin absorbs 5 to 600 nanometers, and burette, that reaction absorbs at 540. So it will add a significant amount of absorption and throw off your, your, your standard. Like here's an example of a standard curve where they added hemoglobin to it, and it appears like it's more than it really should be. And this is just the hemoglobin absorbance spectra. This is what you might see in the lab. And this is your uh, a lipidic sample that looks, you can't see through that at all, can you? It looks like milk or butter kind of, doesn't it? Melted butter? Melted butter? Yeah. I don't know. I've, melted butter looks kind of clear, doesn't it? Yeah. It looks like fat from whenever you do a, uh, a roast. Crock pot, yeah. and let it, it sit like overnight, and all that fat cola, that's, that looks exactly the same. Yeah. yeah, so I was talking to, I guess, Brian, the old the guy who used to be here. When he did his internship at the VA, he saw tons of samples like these come through. From, like, older Well, it, it, it could be from anybody. It's just going to happen if they just had a yeah, fatty breakfast or something. You're going to have a lot of circulating VLDLs or chylomicrons, right? Before they get to be distributed. So, and this is going to cause a lot of light scattering, right? Which is going to decrease the amount in the detector or increase the apparent absorbance or increase the amount of apparent fluorescence too because it's scattering the light shining on it and then it'll scatter to the side. So what you want to do with samples like this is you have to dilute them down to where the, the scatter either goes away or is not significant. So fluorescence interferences, turbidity can cause a significant increase in fluorescence measurements. And that's because you're shining the light to excite the fluorophore. And then you measure the, the amount of light emitted from the fluorophore at a 90 degree angle typically, which is similar to what method? Nephilometry, you guys remember that? <laughs> so nephilometry, you're actually looking for that scatter. But, for, but you measure fluorescence in a similar, similar, similar manner. 
but you don't want the light to scatter to that detector. You want it to be fluoresced to the detector from the, from the fluorophore. So filtration and centrifugation are the best approaches for eliminating the lipidic sample through the turbid silver. Sample blanking can minimize spectral interference. So you have the sample plus a diluent instead of the reagent. So you want to make sure that the blank contains the exact same has the exact same consistency of the sample. The only difference would hopefully be is the sample itself. And you're going to subtract A from blank from A of the test. Works and accept the cases with very high blank absorbance. So if you have a really high blank absorbance, right, that's not going to, because remember, high absorbance, you have the low percent transmittance, but you can have that same error built in the machine as if it would have a high percent transmittance. So you have much more error. So that decreases your sensitivity if you have a high blank absorbance. Reagent blanks are used in a similar fashion. What's a reagent blank? It's if you have reagents that are used in the assay that absorb light, you want to blank it with the, just the reagents alone, right? Because then that'll give you, they'll be contributing to that absorbance too. So. So you can get over some of these interference via k k kinetic measurements, just like the enzyme assay. You can do kinetic measurements, right, which will get rid of that, the lag and the log time if you can see the, do several time points. So instead of endpoint measurements, rate of change of absorption can be measured, and that'll get rid of this interference effects if you just look at the change in absorbance over time versus just some endpoint. If you had the endpoint here, it's going to be a lot higher than the endpoint here, and that's due to that interference. Or have you ever heard of bichromatic analysis? What do you think that means, bichromatic? Measuring at two different wavelengths? And basically, you use one wavelength as what the, the zero absorbance would be for a blank, basically. And you basically subtract the absorbance at this wavelength consider it to be the blank, subtract it from what the observed is, and then you get what the real amount is, basically. Does that make sense? So this, this should equal this. Because there's going to be some kind of background in that blank across the spectral system. A better way, though, is this Allen correction. Have you guys ever seen this, where you measure three wavelengths surrounding the peak of interest? The, well two wavelengths surrounding and then the peak of interest. And you basically take the average absorbance from the two opposing wavelengths and subtract it from the, the wavelength of interest to give you that correction for background interferences in the sample. So it's pretty simple, right? So you take the absorbance at 280 in this example and average it with the absorbance at 320. They don't give you values here, but let's say this is two and this is one. The average would be 1.5. You're gonna subtract 1.5 from the absorbance at, wave, at the wavelength of 300. And of course, that would be outside the range we'd want to use for absorbance, right? Because <laughs> we want to use 0.1 to, to, to 0.9 or 1. So chemical interferences, you can dilute the interferent, of course, but then you're going to dilute your sample, so you're the, the analyte you're interested in, so you might lose some sensitivity there. You can increase the specificity of the reaction if you switch to better antibodies or better column, better you know, stationary phase. You can remove the interference via you know, extractions and so forth. Or you can do kinetic measurements like we just showed rather than single time point measurements or biochrom bichromatic measurements. And this is an example that your book shows you. So the relative absorbance versus time curves of alkaline peak rate reaction for creatinine. You have slow, so you have, uh, it, it, the total reaction you get is a mixture between these fa fast, reactor, fast reactants and slow reactants and then the total creatinine. And they kind of sum together. It'll give you a curve like this where you get an increase in absorbance really fast and then a slower absorbance, which is the point that you're interested in because it contains the total creatinine, and then you get all of the reactants together. Does, does that make sense? So I want to do this reaction in the lab, but 
picric acid is, is bad stuff. Or it can be bad, right? Have you ever heard of that picric acid? If it dries out, like on the threads of the container, it'll explode when you open or close that container. You never heard of that? <laughs> yeah, I wanted to have it so we can measure creatinine levels and then calculate creatinine clearances and stuff like that. But yeah, I don't think they're good for that. I know. So chromatographic interference is the best way is to just remove that exogenous interference, right? Methyl dopa is an example. Removal from the patient two to ten days before, prior to the assay for norepinephrine because that'll interfere chromatographically with norepinephrine. Anybody know what methyl dopa is? Yeah. I think isn't that what they give Parkinson's patients? It's like the precursor to dopamine. Two methods of minimizing chromatographic interference. Increase the specificity of the detector. So if you have a specific fluorescence compound or electrochemical reaction would increase the specificity because the electrochemical you get a, a certain amount of current that will only react with that hopefully. And same thing with fluorescence. If you have fluorescence, it will only excite at a particular wavelength and then emit at a particular wavelength. Can remove the interference via liquid, liquid extractions, multiple extractions, back extractions, absorption or ion exchange chromatography before you're, you're doing the other type of chromatography. Or a dual detector analysis can be used for detecting presence of inter interference. So you can use absorbance and fluorescence or absorbance and electrochemical. You can have dual detectors or dual detector at two different wavelengths because they could have different absorbance spectra that could help you differentiate between the interferon and the analyte you're interested in. And then there's immunochemical interferences, hyperlipidemia, obviously, and heterophile antibodies. Didn't we talk about these before? Did you learn about these in immunology? I know you didn't, John. You didn't have that yet. So Hamas is a, a, a an ex- Huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> is that how you say it? Hamas. Hamas. H-A-M-A. I always like to say Hamas. So then I like to brag how I teach Hamas in the clinical chemistry class. <laughs> so basically, what, what do you guys, can you, what does H-A-M-A mean? That's H-A-A-A, -A -A, which is a definition of, it's like type of heterophilic antibody. What, what's H-A-M-A is one of the more common heterophile antibodies that's going to interfere. What's, what are most primary antibodies you made from? Mice. Mice. Human anti-mouse antibodies. So if you have that in the sample, it's going to interfere with the immunological reaction, right? Because hmm? so, it, it'll, it'll bind all the antibodies, of the primary antibody of that system, right? If you have human anti-mouse antibodies. So typically you want to pre-treat the sample with some sort of animal serum. So you can get rid of those antibodies first. If it's Hamas or human anti-mouse antibodies. Can't help it now, can you? You'll, you'll pre-treat this, uh, you'll, yeah, I can't. You'll treat, if you pre-treat the, 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 the sample with, with mouse serum, hopefully you'll tie up all the anti-mouse antibodies with that serum, right? And saturate it. But you want to check the patient history to see if they've been treated with, with you know, mouse antibodies or, or other types of antibodies that might interfere with them. So. And then there's in vivo interferences such as age, sex, time of day, diet, pregnancy, and menses. So we already talked about that in chapter 18, right? The next chapter. There's those cycles. So that can cause interferences. And then drugs are a common source. 
Didn't you say cocaine would be an interferon? I don't know what it interferes with, but I'm sure it does something. What would you tell us about your, your affiliation with cocaine, sir? <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you, caffeine will interfere with theophylline measurements. So. And then alcohol and smoking can cause interferences, too. Those are two drugs, right? Yeah, those are like my formerly, my two favorite things. Alcohol and smoking and cocaine? <laughs> cocaine and caffeine. <laughs> alcohol and smoking. <laughs> So, and that was it for that chapter. Yay.